Well, sometime in my teens, rather late, probably. Yes, the first time I conducted uh, a, uh, a movement of a Gustav Mahler symphony was in Tangerwood. I was uh, a young conductor there, I was 20, I think, and I conducted the first movement of Mahler II. No, no, I, I uh, enjoyed uh, the challenge of each new experience uh, with the Mahler movement, but it was a challenge. It was very difficult for me to uh, come to grips with the music and to meet the challenge of it. It was a world and a mentality completely foreign to me. I had grown up with Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and whatever, like everybody else. I was also interested in, in a certain amount of contemporary music, uh, Alban Berg, Wieben. Um, it's not that my mind was uh, behind Mahler. It was, I was very happy with the music written up until his birth and after his death. That whole period was foreign to me. And it took me a long while to uh, understand his music. Uh, and it was movement by movement, symphony by symphony, and I don't think, I think it was, I was already in my middle 40s by the time I finally came uh, to grips with the entire Mahler repertoire. Very, very slow. But I'm glad that uh, it took so long because it gave me the opportunity to get into his music movement by movement uh, slowly and thoroughly. Uh, there, I think there's a lot of confusion about his music. Each uh, s symphonic movement, to my mind, is, uh, or each movement in each of his symphonies, is a world unto itself, a separate world. And, for example, I conducted the first movement of Mahler's two, but I didn't understand the second movement. And when I came to it, uh, it was very difficult for me. Now I don't understand what reservations I could have had. It's just ignorance, I suppose, and lack of exposure to, um, um, to, to other movements in music. I, I was very slow in responding to each new challenge. But when I did, I got it, because I am an intuitive musician. And if there is music behind the notes, I will eventually find it. Well, how can you disconnect anybody's life from uh, the music he writes or the words he writes or the, or the paintings he, he paints? Uh, everything in that sense is autobiographical, but not necessarily specific. People tend to be so specific. Uh, uh, Beethoven was in love with Therese when he wrote ABC. Well, yes, but... No, I mean, a composer is a composer first and foremost and writes music. Coming to Mahler and saying, here is a person who was born to weep and every phrase must be uh, a tragic experience is nonsense. Mahler was, like all composers, uh, interested in composing music, firstly. What that music might mean uh, was of importance to him, but he was first and foremost a composer, a technician, wrote music, um, and um, he was interested in sound balances and new sound combinations. All of this has little to do with uh, the philosophical connotations of whatever. Um, and so much of his music has been um, done injustice by conductors, and some, some of them rather good conductors, who had this uh, preconception of Mahler being X or Y or Z. Well, there was that period before the First World War when everyone, every sensitive person, felt that there was a tsunami in the making Things were too quiet. Things were too peaceful. And there was a kind of, and we look at the painting at that time, there was an unease that calm before the storm. 
And Marlowe's being an extremely sensitive person undoubtedly felt that, as well as many other things. He certainly wasn't thinking about the, the, uh, all the catastrophes of the 20th century when he wrote his Fourth Symphony. Um, yes, there are nostalgic and somewhat, uh, uh, well, let's say, um, rather reflective and perhaps sad moments in that symphony, but basically it's, it's a very happy work. Uh, what about the last movement of the Fifth Symphony? Uh, so many people hold it against him that he had the nerve to write a rondo, a happy piece of music. Well, he had every right to be happy too, and the reason he uh, wanted to write uh, something like that was a, is purely from a compositional point of view. He needed a counterweight. He had said all that he had wanted to say in terms of tragedy and irony and conflict and so forth, and nostalgia, Sehnsucht, and now, after when the smoke clears, let's have a happy and 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 uh, glowing statement, and it's a compositional masterpiece, marvelously put together, and is supposed to be just that, a light-hearted rondo, and why not? And people, you see, that, that that's what the problem is with people's preconceptions. Ah, well, you see, that's one of his weaker movements. Not at all. It's one of his best movements, uh, both philosophically and compositionally, because it brought that kind of balance and equanimity that you need. If you're really going to grasp the tragedy of life, you must also be able to love life and enjoy it appreciate the joys that it has to offer. Many conductors, are, as you know, go on ego trips when they, when they conduct, and they eventually think that they themselves wrote the music. And um, this <laughs> the results are, are really pitiful. Well, he was a marvelous conductor, and uh, he knew exactly what he was doing. I don't always agree. Sometimes there are acoustical questions. Uh, something in two will work very well in the Musikverein, but will not work in Avery Fisher Hall in New York. It just doesn't work. And how many times have I done the same piece in different halls with different orchestras? And I always adjust to the realities of the orchestra, the acoustics. Um, and, and, and find myself making changes, uh, subtle changes, very rarely major uh, changes, but changes. And it is fascinating to me that as, as experienced as a conduct, uh, uh, conductor as I am, I find myself when I conduct my own music having to make changes. And Mahler did the same thing. I mean, if he, he, he take his Fifth Symphony, uh, he not only made changes, but he reorchestrated it as if he hadn't written four symphonies before that, which were fantastically uh, well orchestrated. So, I mean, he was still learning on the job. It's hard to believe. But so he was so right, because I compared the two orchestrations. He was right in every instance. Uh, it, it did need improvement. But what I ask is why he didn't get it right the first time. Well, because of the very personal quality of his music. I mean, Mahler is unmistakable. You hear three notes and you know it's Gustav Mahler. Uh, so personal, uh, a lot of jealousy involved. Because, um, you know, they, most people want to hear a rehash of what they already know. They want to feel comfortable in what they're hearing. A little bit of pepper and salt, they're just a little different. But basically, it's a review of what they've already heard a thousand times. Mahler, and that was my problem as a young musician, you know, he came out of nowhere. He was saying things that, in a way that no one had ever said it before, and very boldly, with great, great self-confidence. And it's, I mean, it's shocking. Yes, I think the envy, not to mention uh, racial problems, which played less of a role than one might think. Because uh, at that time, 
yes, his being Jewish or Jewish background was a factor, but not the main factor, because after all, he was given the position of, of uh, general manager, music director of the Vienna State Opera. It was that he was a genius, and people are envy, uh, envious of genius. And um, it took a long time. There are many explanations of, uh, for that, which have been offered by greater minds than myself. But um, I rather think uh, that uh, simply because he was so much at home uh, in the world of opera, uh, that uh, he felt that he had integrated the Kunstform, the, you know, the art form, um, into the way he looked at music, and though he used vocal elements, and though he thought very often um, theatrically, um, I think that uh, his decision was a wise one. I don't think he would have written the kind of opera that uh, you would expect a genius uh, to write. Um, I think he felt too limited by subject matter. Because all the words that he chose for his third symphony or whatever, uh, eighth, um, the words, yes, they create situations, uh, um, contexts. They, they, these words of are frame forming because of frame it, but in terms of action, a doing something to B because it's what C said to D and E is there with with a knife and F is with a gun. And so this wasn't this wasn't for him too specific. Uh, probably what his favorite cigar was. He loved cigars. Um, I don't know, I've been very, always very embarrassed to ask any composer uh, of whatever value any question because uh, I am instinctively against uh, verbalizations. I'll ask him about a note. I once asked Stravinsky about a note in the, uh, uh, in the uh, Firebird. And, you know, I showed him the score and obviously a mistake, he said, oh, don't bother, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, and Strauss is always saying the same thing. Es ist mir wurscht, you know. Fies, F, na, spiel keine Rolle. You get these ridiculous answers because composers hate to be asked questions anyway. Uh, I mean, good composers. So, um, I don't think I would have asked him anything. And I think I would have been very embarrassed to have him hear any of, him, of my interpretations of his music, as he was embarrassed in interpreting his own music. Composers, great composers, are embarrassed by their music, as opposed to mediocre composers who love their music. The more you love your own music, the worse the composer you are. I mean, you, of course you're embarrassed because you're embarrassed because it reveals too much about you. And everything you would want to know about Gustav Mahler is in his music. It's like looking right into his soul. And that would embarrass anybody. I mean, who wants to walk down the street and be transparent? People can look right into your heart and your mind, and that's what you do when you listen to his music. Um, and so, out of respect for his privacy, I would never have asked him anything. <laughs>